I'm sorry, we're supposed to believe the tyrannical leader of the world is Justin Trudeau for allowing Canadian police officers to arrest criminals, but not Vladimir Putin who's invaded Ukraine because he just wants it for himself? The far right has lost its goddamn mind. And welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. The Supreme Court. How long does something last once it's become corrupted? How long do we accept the rule of those who no longer represent us? Law and order are the cornerstone of a functioning civil society, but if the law itself has been corroded by those who would use it for their own benefit, how long until the law itself is rejected? The night Trump won the 2016 election, I was horrified. I left the room before all the results were in to have a shower, mostly so I could cry in peace. As I left the room, my husband said to me, it's not over yet. And I said, oh, it's over. And I turned on the shower as hot as possible and I cried for the debasement of our country. I cried that such a disgustingly awful man with absolutely no experience could be placed on the highest pedestal our nation had to offer. That we could allow a known liar and con man and credible rapist with such misogynistic and racist tendencies to represent us. That as the meme that goes around all the time with Trump and Hillary's face says that we could believe the absolute worst rumors about a woman, but ignore the worst facts about a man. I cried that such a capable person could be defeated by such an incompetent person. And I cried for the 70 plus million Americans that couldn't see what a self-serving monster their candidate was. But I also cried for the Supreme Court. Because I knew that between the dark money backing, the Republicans' plan to take over the judiciary, and Trump's absolute lack of interest in whom he put on the bench, that the door was now open for the most conniving people to walk right through and take the Supreme Court for themselves. We're only one year into the newly established 6-3 conservative far-right court, and not only are we looking at the abandonment of the Voting Rights Act and the overturning of a woman's legal right to her own body, we're discussing the reversal of affirmative action and even Griswold, the backbone of privacy laws that led to Roe and gay marriage and trans rights and contraception. That seems to be up for debate. There is even talk of Brown v. Board of Education having been decided incorrectly. I spoke a lot about the Supreme Court in my podcast, The Death of Roe, which if you haven't listened to it, I highly recommend you go back and check out. Not because I am so freaking amazing, but because it is packed full of information that we all need to get our heads around if we're going to do anything to start solving the problem of a corrupted and captured far-right court. My podcasts are not so much current event-based as current event adjacent, so they're conceptual pieces that you can go back and listen to without things feeling dated. What I say in the row piece that's relevant here is that our entire legal system is built on precedent or decisions made by the Supreme Court. Lawyers all over the country use cases that have been decided by the highest court in the land as examples of why a judge or jury should rule in their favor. Supreme Court decisions are the foundation of our entire rule of law. And because of this, you have to have a really, really good reason to overturn a settled Supreme Court decision. So unless some grievous injustice has been made, the court is supposed to uphold its own previous rulings in order to give our justice system a sense of stability. But if the Supreme Court starts knocking down its own cases and changing long-established precedent for no discernible reason other than it's what they personally want to do or because it accomplishes an agenda that they want to achieve, how long does the Supreme Court itself remain legitimate? If the justices will supersede established law, if any decision the Supreme Court makes can simply be overturned by different justices with different opinions, what is the law other than the fleeting whim of nine politically appointed people? And if that's the case, why should 340 million people be beholden to those whims? The current makeup of the Supreme Court clearly has an agenda. And if you care to look, it's terrifying for the legitimacy of our rule of law and way of life. So today we're going to talk about the Supreme Court, its importance to American society, its capture by the far right, and what, if anything, can be done to save it from itself. I want to be clear, this is a completely fucked up situation, and pretending any of this is business as usual will be our undoing. In fact, that is how we got in this position in the first place. President Biden has just nominated Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson to replace Justice Breyer, who is retiring in June. And before she was even named, the Republicans were up in arms about his choice and how inappropriate it was going to be. And even though at the end of the day, Biden's choice will make no difference to the conservative power on the court. 
The court is currently a 6-3 conservative majority, and with Breyer's replacement, it will remain a 6-3 conservative majority. So keep that in your hat as you hear them screeching about it in the days to come. Some background. In 1789, when George Washington was president, the framers of our Constitution, our founding fathers, were concerned that this idea of the United States could fail. They worried that each state would be so concerned with its own self-interest that they wouldn't be able to succeed as a unit and they would splinter. So the very first piece of legislation the Senate ratified was the Judiciary Act of 1789, which made a motion to establish the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, with justices appointed by the president, was established with a strict mandate to uphold the Constitution as the supreme law of the land and make sure all the states were accountable to the same laws. The Founding Fathers were adamant that the states not return to their own individual fiefdoms, which they believed would weaken national unity. In Federalist Paper No. 78, Alexander Hamilton wrote that judicial independence was the best way for the government to secure a steady, impartial administration of the law And he pointed out that if we wanted everyone to be functioning under the same laws, then it was essential we have a court that would oversee those laws. And that worked for a long time. Yes, we still had federalism and states' rights, and progress moved painfully slowly. But overall, we progressed as a nation and moved forward, despite our enormous size and regional differences. And we moved forward as a unit, because we smartly were being overseen by a group of seemingly independent jurors acting as a separate but equal arm of the government, upholding our constitutional rights. But over the past 40 years, very powerful right-wing groups have been targeting that arm of the government. If the court is to oversee and be the final word on all laws, then their plan, which is finally coming to fruition, would be to make sure that the justices that sit on that court decide the laws in a way that the powers that be deem fit. To be clear, this is the exact opposite of how justice is supposed to function. Justice herself is always portrayed as blind, a woman holding a scale, wearing a blindfold. Because the law is not supposed to be decided on the petty whims of man, but on the merits of the law itself, blind to prejudice and politics and human foibles. So we find ourselves in a position where this very new right-wing, very politicized court has taken the blindfold off. They aren't, as they always say, just calling balls and strikes. They are umpires paid to call the game in a certain way. As I said, Now that the court is a 6-3 majority, they're not even pretending to be unbiased anymore. These justices, who in their own confirmation hearings agreed to uphold established precedent, are now upending laws willy-nilly in a kind of, well, what are you going to do kind of a way. The decision to uphold Texas's obscene six-week abortion ban, completely against the precedent of Roe, was only the first step. They seem well and truly ready to throw out the entire precedent of a woman's right to bodily autonomy by this summer. 50 years of established law gone overnight. Why? Because the science changed? The facts changed? Our knowledge around abortion changed? No, because the majority on the court changed. That's not a blind interpretation of the law. That's a shaping of the law using personal bias. And while some people might be able to overlook women's rights because they're super religious or they can't have babies or they just see women as less deserving to rights as men, it's far more difficult to overlook things that might apply to everyone like voting rights, which our new Supreme Court is indicating they are also quite ready to roll back. So let's talk about Alabama. Last year, Alabama's Republican-controlled legislature redrew its congressional maps so it packed the majority of black voters into a single district by encompassing the cities of Birmingham and Montgomery, which are nowhere near each other, while spreading out the remaining votes throughout six majority white districts, essentially doing the two things that under the Voting Rights Act of 1965 they aren't allowed to do. They packed voters into a district so as to limit their voice and cracked voters into multiple other districts to dilute their voice. And they did this by race. In doing so, Alabama Republicans were able to successfully reduce the voting strength of the entire black community in the state to one district out of seven, despite the fact that the black population is over one quarter of the state. After the map was drawn, the state was immediately sued by black Alabamans for violating their rights, and a three-judge panel in Alabama District Court agreed with the black voters of Alabama. And these Alabama justices were not some group of woke liberal elites. All three justices were conservative Republicans, one appointed by Reagan and two appointed by Trump. 
but they ruled that this new map did most likely completely violate the Voting Rights Act, and they ordered the Republican state legislature to draw new maps with at least two districts in which black voters had the opportunity to elect a representative of their choice. Essentially, just make the map a little bit closer to representing their state as a whole. But Republican lawmakers got the verdict and they were like, mm, no. And they appealed the decision all the way up to the Supreme Court, which despite having an incredibly full caseload, took the case up immediately. They didn't say, okay, we'll hear your case, get in line. They said, oh, this is a very important case. Let's decide on it right away. And without oral arguments or months of briefs, they decided to override the Alabama court's decision and allow the Alabama state legislature to stay with their packed and cracked map that completely negated black voters against the express laws stated in the Voting Rights Act. Excuse me, what? They will hear the full case in October, but for now, by a 5-4 decision, that map stays as it is. To be clear, the Alabama decision was so far out of bounds that even Chief Justice Roberts, a staunch conservative who is no friend of the Voting Rights Act, dissented and sided with the liberal justices. In case you don't know, Justice Roberts basically started his legal career fighting against the Voting Rights Act as a young lawyer in the 1980s. John Roberts is the justice who authored the majority opinion when the court gutted one half of the Voting Rights Act in 2013. John Roberts is the justice who wrote an op-ed last year that took aim at gutting the other half of the Voting Rights Act. That, John Roberts, thought the Alabama decision was too far out of line. As Linda Greenhouse, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist on the court, says, if you lose John Roberts, you know it's bad. At the time, Roberts stated the Alabama District Court had properly applied existing law to an extensive opinion, and there were no apparent errors for the Supreme Court to correct. And yet the far-right justices of Alito and Gorsuch and Thomas and Kavanaugh and Barrett felt a correction was in fact in order. The liberal justices, Kagan, Breyer, and Sotomayor, dissented even further from John Roberts, accusing the majority of using the court's emergency shadow docket to not only intervene improperly with a lower court case, but also to change voting right laws in the process. Greenhouse points out that what's happening with the courts over Alabama's decision isn't some little riff over procedure. What happened was a raw power play by a runaway majority that seems to recognize no stopping point. Justice Elena Kagan, who dissented from the decision with the court's other liberal voices, vocally criticized the court for siding with the Alabama Republicans without a full briefing or argument. She said, this is just one more in a disconcertingly long line of cases in which this court uses the shadow docket to signal or make changes to the law. She went on to say, the case is a serious matter, which the court should not decide without thorough consideration. And yet that's exactly what they did. It is just like how they handled the controversial Texas bill that turned citizens into anti-abortion vigilantes and what they might do with affirmative action in the coming months. As Justice Kagan says, not only does this decision do a disservice to black Alabamans, but it's in violation of a standing law that the court itself once held up as a pillar of American democracy. And just so we're all on the same page... The Supreme Court usually decides a case after all the parties involved have submitted months worth of legal briefings, explaining their position, and then verbally arguing that case in front of them. The justices then can ask deep and probing legal questions about how the Constitution applies to each argument. The justices will then give their verdict and sign the verdict so it's clear how each justice voted in the case. The shadow docket, in contrast, is typically only used in emergencies when the high court has to temporarily uphold or block a law. In this case, the parties involved file their briefs in days, not months, and there are generally no oral arguments. But that's not how the court is supposed to function, just quietly taking cases they want to hear without any lawyers talking and just go ahead and change established constitutional rights because of it. Keep in mind the court also votes on which cases they want to take up. So the conservative majority not only gets to decide most case results, they also get to decide what cases are heard at all. In the case of Alabama and the original stay of the Texas abortion ban, both were put on the shadow docket. In fact, when the court allowed the Texas abortion ban to stand, despite established precedent of Roe v. Wade, Justice Kagan wrote, the majority's decision is emblematic of too much of this court's shadow docket decision-making, which every day becomes more unreasoned, inconsistent, and impossible to defend. Justice Sotomayor minced even less words, saying, if we do this, 
If we overturn a law and force women to proceed with unwanted pregnancies and we don't have a reason for it other than political will, how can this court survive? She says, and I quote, Will this institution survive the stench this creates in the public perception that the Constitution and its reading are nothing more than political acts? The right wing of the court claims they're just using the shadow docket a lot more than it's ever been used because it helps them move things along more efficiently. Justice Alito says it's nonsense to criticize them for using it because they aren't deciding the cases so much as just considering emergency requests. But it's hard to see it as anything other than a decision when they overrule a lower court ruling like they did in Alabama or uphold a law that overrides the law of the land like they did in Texas. The current law of the land is that abortion is legal. It's not nonsense when six people vote to make life and death decisions for millions of people against a standing law. And honestly, it's pretty arrogant to suggest it is. Linda Greenhouse makes it clear that the majority's agenda of cutting back on the scope of the Voting Rights Act has always been Chief Justice Roberts' agenda. He made it abundantly clear in the past and suggests it in a kind of code all the time. But in Alabama's case, he seems to be making the point that the far-right justices were being too obvious about it. Roberts was clearly indicating to the new justices, just wait until this comes to trial. I will rule with you. You're giving away the game. But the far-right justices seem to think they can give away the game as much as they want, because who's going to stop them? By granting this stay to the Alabama Republicans, the conservative majority effectively changed the law, freeing Alabama and any other states to devise any kind of racial gerrymandering they want, regardless of the Voting Rights Act. The far-right members of the court seem to be going above and beyond the law to make a decision that they want. Because if the Voting Rights Act can't protect the rights of black citizens in the rural South, Does it even exist? If this current court gets its way, no. As Ian Milhauser wrote for Vox, the court just made it much harder to stop attacks on the right to vote. And this should alarm everybody. Because if the highest court in the land is not beholden to established law, if precedent means nothing, if they can just make and abandon laws as they personally see fit, what's next? It's naive to think that Christian conservatives, the ones who have built and support this current Supreme Court, will stop at outlawing abortion. They're already talking about Griswold, the case that decided that the states have no business in the private life of American married couples when it comes to contraception. The far-right justices are now suggesting they aren't sure that case was decided correctly. And if they get rid of Griswold, then they can get rid of contraception. Perhaps follow that up with premarital sex biracial marriage, gay marriage, or just gay sex in general, which until Lawrence v. Texas was against the law. In fact, the court has just agreed to take up the case of a Colorado website designer who wants to put discriminatory language on her website to state unequivocally that she will not design any websites for anyone who identifies in the LGBTQIA community. But her state's laws against discrimination stop her from posting that disclaimer. She claims that violates her free speech and her freedom of religion. Now, to be clear, no one has asked her to design a website. In fact, her entire business is far-right conservative politicians and Christian websites. She just wants to be free to let her bigotry flag fly. And so far, the far-right Supreme Court seems pretty excited to set the precedent that she is allowed to do just that. And to be clear, if that case is successful, it opens the door for the legality of broader discrimination on the whole. If this court decides you don't have to remain silent about your beliefs under the First Amendment, it's tenement to accepting a whole host of winning cases where people choose to deny service on the grounds of racial bias or country of origin or sexual discrimination. One photographer has already said that if this case is successful, he's going to refuse service to black and mixed race couples because of his beliefs. And no one can stop him because those are his First Amendment rights of free speech. So how do you feel about that? Because these are the kinds of moves that have been in the works for about 50 years. We were moving forward, baby steps, but still in the right direction, to freedom and fairness and equal rights under the law. But while we were doing that, the far-right, religious, corporate-aligned powers have been working very hard behind the scenes to unravel all of it. And they might have finally just built a court that will do just that. Prior to 1994, The majority of the Supreme Court confirmation votes were fundamentally based on judicial qualifications rather than political ideology. But when Justice Antonin Scalia died in 2016, the wheels just came right off the bus. 
Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who claimed he was going to make Obama a one-term president, had held up all of Obama's legislation and had forced the Democratic senators to abandon the filibuster for federal judges because he refused to have any of his members vote on any of them, and there were hundreds of federal judgeships open all over the country, was suddenly claiming the Senate couldn't confirm a new justice in an election year because the people needed to have their say. He made up a rule. So for the first time since 1930, the Senate just refused to hold a hearing for an open Supreme Court justice seat. They didn't reject Obama's nominee and current U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland. They just refused to engage. And 10 months later, Trump won the election. McConnell filled the seat with Neil Gorsuch. Brett Kavanaugh followed soon after when sitting Justice Anthony Kennedy abruptly retired. And they finished up with Amy Coney Barrett six days before Trump lost the election. All three of Trump's picks were handpicked from hyper-conservative Federalist Society, of which Alito, Thomas, and Roberts were already members. All three justices barely had enough votes to be confirmed, but all three of them are lifetime appointments anyway. Today's court looks nothing like the American electorate. As I said, all six conservative justices have ties to the far-right Libertarian Federalist Society, an influential nonprofit for conservative and libertarian lawyers that serves as a pipeline for federal justices. All three of Donald Trump's nominees were personally handpicked by its founder, Leonard Leo. All six justices are Catholic or deeply Christian, and all six quite clearly make decisions based around their faith and their politics, two things that the Supreme Court justices are not supposed to do. The court is supposed to represent the country it presides over, and our country is not 67% far-right Christian conservative. In many ways, it all comes back to Leonard Leo. Federalist Society co-chairman and former executive vice president, Leo is the architect of the judiciary's pivotal shift to the right. But when Trump was elected, he ramped up the entire operation. Trump didn't know anything or care to know anything about judges. He wanted to win the election, and the Federalist Society came with influence, money, and support. So Trump promised to let Leo decide all his judicial nominees in exchange for the Federalist Society's support. Quid pro quo. The man is nothing if not loyal to his own needs. The Federalist Society then went on to select reliable right-wing judicial nominees, had its advisors shepherd those nominees through the Senate, and spent millions of dollars of dark money on PR campaigns and ads to make sure their nominees ended up confirmed. According to the Washington Post and independent researchers who built on the Post's reporting, Leonard Leo's network took in over $400 million in dark money to engineer the takeover of the federal court system. Because if you can't pass laws that you want because you live in a democracy and people don't want those laws, then you buy and stack the court to roll those laws back or stop them from going into effect. Leo found a way to essentially litigate from the bench because the majority of the country doesn't want what he and his donors want, so they had to find another way to get it. And the courts were that way. Leo takes credit for installing five Supreme Court justices, John Roberts, Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. Leo is also on the board of directors of Opus D's Catholic Information Center, the center which, according to Church and State magazine, is a rallying point for ultra-conservative Catholics eager for a voice in the secular halls of government to advance their hard-right political agenda. Now, I could do an entire pod on Opus D, which is a secret society and official arm of the Catholic Church whose roots are in fascist Spain, but I would end up sounding like a tinfoil hat-wearing Dan Brown novel. Suffice it to say, there is a serious religious bend to these far-right conservative big-money donors, justices, lawmakers, and captains of industry. And when I say religious, I mean hardcore Catholic, like rolling back the clock kind of stuff. They're not just originalists when it comes to the Constitution, but they think that like maybe things were best for everyone when the Constitution was actually written. You know, in the late 1770s, back when minorities and women knew their place. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, member of the Judiciary Committee, has been talking about how the court has been captured by dark money for years. That the far right turned its eyes on the court when it realized it was losing its handle on the will of the electorate. And since 2010, when the Citizens United decision came down and the Supreme Court basically opened the door for unlimited dark money to flood the political landscape, these groups have been incredibly successful. According to Federal Communications Commission filings, the Judicial Crisis Network, a web of allied groups that have spent millions over the past several decades to transform the judiciary into a conservative force, have placed more than 10,000 ads since 2012 to get the minority control they want, 
Donors are giving 15, 17, 48 million dollars at a time. What do you get for that kind of money, you have to wonder? As White House says, here's the truth. Dark money court packing is a project by right-wing donors that's been supercharged by Republican justices and Republican defenders in the Senate. Woof. That's a lot. I know. From the creation of a court to keep us together to the corruption of a court looking to divide us, I've probably depressed you a bit. I feel that because I've depressed myself. So let's take a moment for a little palate cleanser to talk about how to feel a tiny bit better. The world is scary right now, and I wanted to give you some insight and hope. My thoughts are with the people of Ukraine, and my anger overflows for Putin and the far-right Americans who call themselves patriots. But I know that anger is not what we need right now. So I'm going to share some insight I learned from a Medium article written by Josh Spector that really spoke to me. The article is called 45 Things to Remember When the World Gets Scary. And I won't tell you all 45 things, but I highly recommend you look up Josh's work for yourself so you can read them. But for now, here are the standouts that I found about how to live in a world that seems out of control. We need to remember this isn't the first time the world's been scary and it won't be the last. The vast majority of people care. They care about people they know and they care about people they don't know. Thousands of brilliant people have dedicated their lives to prepare for this moment and they will do heroic things even if they don't realize they're capable of it right now. We are in uncharted territory, but we are about to chart it. There are heroes among us and if there's something you can do to help, find it and do it and repeat it. There will be moments when you realize that you are doing the same thing you did before the world turned upside down. Let those moments remind you that not everything has changed. Patterns can bring a comfort. Your words and actions influence how scary the world appears to those around you, so make sure you choose them wisely. Listen to the wisdom of older generations and remember the optimism of our youth. Be there for the people you love and the people you love will be there for you. You might physically feel this fear and anxiety. You'll feel achy or tired or you'll eat more or less than you normally do. That doesn't mean you're not handling the situation. It means you're processing it. You are stronger and more resilient than you can imagine. Look for the lessons in what we're living through and learn them and remember them because fear brings clarity and it reveals what most matters to all of us. Don't miss that insight. Finally, believe there will come a day where things are better than they are today. Fear is easy and hope is hard, but hope is the only thing evil can't kill, so we must always keep it alive. We stand with Ukraine. We stand with the trans and LGBTQIA communities being attacked by our own government. We stand with the communities whose perspectives are being pulled from our libraries and burned on pyres. We stand with those whose votes are being suppressed and whose lives are being disrupted by hate and bigotry. We stand with all of those who have lost someone to this hideous virus and who fight against it now. We see you. There are still more good people than bad in this world. And although we might be in an existential fight between good and evil, we have been here before and good when it fights with bravery and passion has always won and it will be victorious again. Come at me, bro. You think we're weak? You have no idea what you're talking about. We'll be right back after this. Politics Girl has a new sponsor, Third Love. Now, Third Love is a company specifically for women, but I want men in my audience to listen because it's a great place to buy gifts or recommend to the women in your life. Okay, now I'm gonna get a little personal. I hate bras. If I can help it, I do not wear them. And when I do wear them, they do not fit right. They fall off my shoulder, they gape in weird places, they're too tight or they ride up, and quite frankly, I find them miserable. Stupid Dr. Oz talking about masks the other day saying, who wears something for eight hours a day? Well, women do, Dr. Oz, and they're called bras. And we hate them, but we do it anyway, so grow up. But Third Love then sent me a bunch of their things to try. They sent me bras and jogging pants and jammies and workout wear, and I have to say, what a company. First of all, I didn't just put on a bra for this show. I've been wearing a bra all week. You know that perfect piece of clothing, the one that fits just right, the one you don't have to break in, the one that feels good and looks good right from the beginning? For Third Love, that's their 24-7 classic t-shirt bra. 
It's the number one bra for a reason. It doesn't pinch, it doesn't dig, it has ultra-thin memory foam cups and straps that don't slip, it's so smooth it looks invisible, and it comes in cup sizes A through I, including Third Love's exclusive, dun dun da half cup sizes. Yeah, it comes in halves, because we all know that we don't all fit into the same size bras. They have this really cool online quiz to walk you through all the issues you have and they have a perfect fit promise. So if you don't love the fit, you can exchange it or return it for free for 60 days. They even have an expert fit stylist available to answer all your questions. And if all that isn't enough, Third Love is the largest donor of undergarments in the US. They partner with organizations all over the United States and have donated over $40 million worth of bras to help people in need. This is an amazing company, but feeling is believing. Give your girls the 24 seven comfort and support they deserve. Upgrade your bras today and get 20% off your first order at thirdlove.com slash politicsgirl. That's 20% off at thirdlove.com slash politicsgirl. I'm telling you, I even went on and ordered more for myself and I used my own damn code. <laughs> the Politics Girl podcast is sponsored by Athletic Greens. And if you've been listening to this pod, you know I'm a huge fan. But you know who else is a fan? My family. In fact, my boys just went away skiing for four days for my son's 14th birthday, and they had to take their Athletic Green travel packs with them because they couldn't imagine missing one day. Okay, so what is Athletic Greens? Athletic Greens is a powder supplement that goes into water. You start the day with one scoop on an empty stomach, and their special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, energy recovery, focus, and sleep. It's a one-day micro habit that uses the best products and is based on the latest science. In fact, their current formula is on its 53rd iteration because they're constantly updating it as the science advances. No matter how you eat, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, it fits into your lifestyle. It has less than one gram of sugar per serving, no GMOs, no chemicals or artificial anything. My boys said they couldn't imagine having gone into those busy athletic days without AG1 to give them the energy and nutrition they needed. But for the record, I don't do anything athletic and I feel exactly the same way. Now is the time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into flu and cold season. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is gonna give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash politics girl. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash politics girl to take ownership over your health and get the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. I know we're all trying to cut down on carbs and sugar and just unhealthy foods in general, but it starts to feel like you can't eat anything anymore. But with Magic Spoon cereal, we can go back to that bad for you deliciousness without all the bad stuff in it. Magic Spoon comes in all those traditional fun flavors you remember as a kid. Cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, but it has zero grams of sugar, 14 grams of protein, and is only 140 calories and four net grams of carbs per serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-friendly, grain-free, soy-free, and you can get all that yummy deliciousness without the junk food guilt. Now, you can even build your own box with custom flavors that appeal to you, including new flavors like blueberry and cinnamon and cookies and cream and maple waffle. The Canadian in me appreciates that one. If that all sounds good to you, go to magicspoon.com slash politicsgirl and use the code politicsgirl for $5 off your order. In addition to your cereal boxes, be sure to grab some cereal bars while supplies last. Magic Spoon is so confident you're gonna like their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. That's magicspoon.com slash politicsgirl to get $5 off a custom bundle of cereal and to try out their new delicious cereal bars. And for my Canadian and British friends, Magic Spoon is now shipping to Canada and the UK. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. And we're back and talking about the court that dark money built and the right-wing influence that's been put on hyperdrive by Republican justices and Republican defenders in the Senate. Mitch McConnell was a huge force behind the plan to hijack the court for the far right, and like it or not, he's done an exceptional job. He held up Obama's Supreme Court seat when he made up his rule. Then he put Gorsuch in his place. He filled the next seat with the wildly unsuitable Brett Kavanaugh. Then he disregarded his own made-up rule to jam Amy Coney Barrett onto Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat without a single Democrat showing up to give him a quorum to vote. I mean, fuck the rules of morality. That guy plays to win. In the meantime, he also filled all the available federal judgeships with far-right conservative players, 10 of whom were even deemed not qualified by American Bar Association 
And finally, he made sure Republican senators voted as a block to stop any additional donor disclosure requirements and continue to push to get rid of the ones we already have. McConnell and Don McGahn, who at the time was the White House counsel for Trump, wrote a brief together saying, when it comes to campaign contributions, transparency is not important for democracy. As White House points out, today we have a court that was built by dark money with its own specific agenda, a court who will reliably hand down decisions that favor their donors and their donors' wishes for the direction of the country. The current Roberts Court has handed down more than 80 partisan 5-4 to four and 6-3 to three decisions that are easily shown to benefit Republican donor interests. These wins often come at the expense of regular Americans, stripping away protections for minority voters, reproductive rights, workers' rights, the environment, and public health. And these days, more often than not, they also degrade our democracy, greenlighting gerrymandering, protecting dark money, and suppressing the vote. And you can say, hey, both sides take secret donations. And that would be true. As White House points out, progressive money groups receive anonymous donations too. But he goes on to say that that's only because Democrats have to play by the rules the Republicans have set, or it would be tenement to surrender. But the difference is, Democrats keep trying to pass bills to eradicate dark money in politics, and the Republicans keep voting against those bills. Just like both sides can benefit from gerrymandering, but only one side keeps voting to get rid of it. You can't really complain about something you keep voting to keep. You know what I'm saying? Senator Whitehouse wrote the legislation himself to clean up this problem. He brought his Disclose Act, the bill to end dark money in politics and judiciary, to the floor, and every single Senate Democrat was ready to vote in favor of it. But as Whitehouse says, dark money power is too important a weapon for right-wing donors to abandon. So the Republicans filibustered the bill from even coming up for debate. White House puts it well when he says, Americans are drowning in anonymous political attacks and misinformation. A dark money tsunami is washing over our democracy with virtually no way for the public to see who's behind it. It's no wonder Americans are losing faith in our political system. It's time to require big corporations and anonymous ultra-rich donors to take responsibility for their crooked influence campaigns. The public has a right to know who is paying billions of dollars to influence their vote. We know most Republicans are pro-money, pro-power, and they work for whomever or whatever can give them the most of it. But when talking about how the Supreme Court has been structured, you can't undervalue religion on that list of driving factors. Rulings in favor of religion have increased from 46% in 1969 to 83% today, with the biggest leap occurring in the current Chief Justice Roberts Court. While the courts of the 50s and 60s were known for protecting minorities or non-mainstream religions, mainstream Christian groups are now the ones most often claiming minority status. Christians all over the country are now claiming to be persecuted. They feel that the separation of church and state itself is discriminatory. They say keeping religion or prayer out of public schools is not in fact neutral, but imposing the religion of secularism. We see these ideas reflected in court decisions, like in the Hobby Lobby or Little Sisters of the Poor cases, in which the court ruled they could both deny their employees birth control for religious reasons. Or the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, where the court ruled that a conservative baker should be able to deny service to a gay couple because their marriage is against his religion. The idea we keep hearing about religious liberty is just a way for Catholics and far-right Christians to impose their will on those who don't share their beliefs under the guise of freedom when it's really anything but. Now we find ourselves in an America where people are banning books and we're discussing the idea of getting rid of contraception and interracial and same-sex marriage. As Margaret Talbot wrote in the New Yorker article, Amy Coney Barrett's Long Game, Though conservative justices now dominate the court, it's striking how firmly they hold the notion of themselves as the persecuted figures. In 2020, after a long string of court victories for religious freedom lawsuits, Alito gave a speech to the Federalist Society in which he warned that in certain quarters, religious liberty is fast becoming a disfavored right. He asserted that the right to keep and bear arms was the ultimate second-tier constitutional right. As if the America of 2022 is some kind of danger to Christianity and gun rights, and these conservative justices are simply the last line of defense for the defenseless. Yeah, the defenseless, with their $400 million ad budget and stacked courts. 
Barrett recently gave a speech at a private event in Louisville, Kentucky, where she said, My goal today is to convince you that this court is not compromised of a bunch of partisan hacks. But innocently insisting that from the stage of the McConnell Center, with Mitch McConnell, who so brazenly and hypocritically strong-armed her onto the court, standing behind her, is a bit of a tough nut to swallow. Which might be why the public approval ratings of the Supreme Court is at an all-time low. And why there is serious talk in Washington of reforming it by expanding the number of justices on the court or limiting justices' terms. As Talbot points out in her New Yorker article, when Amy Coney Barrett sat through her confirmation hearing, she was pleasant and non-ideological and disciplined to the point of blandness. Yet according to Daniel Bennett, professor at John Brown University, a Christian college in Arkansas, Barrett is the most embedded in the conservative Christian legal movement than any justice we've ever had. In fact, her background and demeanor suggested that if placed on the court, she would deliver exactly what they wanted, expanded gun rights and religious liberties and getting rid of Roe. So when California Senator Dianne Feinstein pressed her to discuss Roe, Barrett refused, adding piously that it would actually be wrong and a violation of the canons for me to do that as a sitting judge. But she was asked that because her personal views on abortion were incredibly well known. In 2006, she signed her name to a full-page ad calling for the end of the barbaric legacy of Roe v. Wade. But here she is saying her beliefs are irrelevant to her rulings. Then she becomes a judge, and in the first year, she undermines Roe twice and is now looking to overturn it completely. During the Mississippi argument, she even went so far as to question why carrying a child to term would be an unfair obligation to a mother. She said, we have safe haven laws. Why can't the women just have the babies and then give it up? Wouldn't that take care of the problem? No, that wouldn't take care of the problem. As Justice Kagan challenged, overturning Roe would be profoundly disruptive because the vast majority of American women have spent their entire adult lives under its protection. The law is part of the fabric of women's existence in this country. But Barrett and the other conservative justices don't seem to care about that. In fact, they don't seem to care about any bedrock case if it doesn't fit into their agenda of elevating their version of morality over others. They believe the world should be different, and they are secure in their righteousness in making it so. We're already seeing states creating laws that allow you to sue teachers if you don't like what they're teaching. Laws that allow you to sue people providing gender-affirming care. Governor Greg Abbott of Texas is writing a law to charge parents of transgender kids with child abuse. Florida just passed their Don't Say Gay bill. We can now fire librarians and educators who keep books the far-right Christian parents don't want on the shelves. The court has a case on their docket that will wildly change our ability to regulate guns in America and another one that will completely stymie our chance to deal with climate change because it will limit the government's ability to regulate corporations. There is a plan to reshape America in a particular image, and these justices are following through with that plan. And those of us paying attention need our own plan if we're not going to get caught up in the goddamn Handmaid's Tale or 1850s, which is the reason people are talking about expanding the court. Clearly, this court has been co-opted. We have three justices that were installed by a corrupt, twice-impeached criminal who incited a coup against his own country to stay in power, a president who didn't win the popular vote in 2016 or 2020, and those justices were confirmed by senators who represent the vast minority of Americans. One had absolutely no experience, one is a credible sexual predator, and the third is a bought and paid for shell for the Federalist Society who spends much of his free time on private tours with Republican lawmakers. Add them to the two conservative activist judges who are already on the court, one who's completely compromised by his wife's connection to the insurrection, and the whole thing becomes ridiculous. Why should these five people have such power over the interpretation of all American law? No one elected them. In fact, the majority of the country didn't even elect the person who nominated and confirmed them. Alexander Hamilton said the independence of the courts is essential in a limited constitution. But this crew is not independent. In fact, they are clearly working in tandem with one deeply compromised political party. We know Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is in constant contact with Justice Thomas. We know Neil Gorsuch just spoke at a private Federalist Society event with Mike Pence and Governor DeSantis and that the media was barred from the event. We know someone looked the other way on Kavanaugh's FBI investigation. We know six of the nine people who get to decide all our laws are members of the same private society, one that is highly conservative, religious, and dedicated to corporate power. 
67% of the Supreme Court is Catholic. 20% went to the same prep school. The newest judges were groomed by higher-ups with specific agendas tailored for this exact moment, and none of them are impartial. How long are the good, law-abiding citizens of America going to let six people with obvious agendas roll back our laws without doing anything? As Robert Reich, American economist and political commentator, says, it's not radical to expand the Supreme Court. What's radical is allowing Supreme Court justices, appointed by presidents who lost the popular vote, to take away rights from millions of Americans. So what can we do? Are we helpless to this activist court taking us back in time? How do we counter these actions? President Biden had a bipartisan commission look into this problem, but the results were lackluster at best. Their general gist was anything that's done will likely be seen as a partisan maneuver, and any lawmaker backing any change will be seen as a partisan position. But to that I say, that ship has sailed. The court is already partisan. Partisan positions have already been taken. Taking active steps to counter that would not undermine the court's legitimacy, but rather bolster it. But for now, let's take each option one at a time. Can we add justices to the court? The simple answer is yes. Can we change term limits? The simple answer is no. The Constitution does offer a check on judicial power, impeachment and removal, but you need two-thirds of the Senate to accomplish that. And with our current Congress, that's a non-starter. But it is yet another reason to vote more Democrats into office. We can't even insist that, say, Justice Thomas recuse himself from any case involving the insurrection that his wife is so deeply invested in because Article 3 of the Constitution leaves recusals up to the court itself. So unless his five conservative allies come together to insist he sit this one out, no one can force him to do anything. The number of the Supreme Court justices is not set by the Constitution, so changing the number of justices would not require a constitutional amendment like changing the lifetime appointment would. And since the Constitution doesn't specify the number of justices, that leaves the issue up to Congress. Congress commands the purse. As Alexander Hamilton put it in Federalist Paper 78, it pays all the judges' salaries. And since the legislature pays the tab, the legislature gets to decide how many justices we have. Over time, Congress has added and subtracted Supreme Court justices numerous times. They just haven't done it in 150 years. We've had a Supreme Court that consisted of five, six, seven, nine, even ten justices. These changes have been for different reasons. Some of them were decidedly political. But why is it that so many of us think that this requirement of nine members on the Supreme Court is carved in stone? It's probably because no one alive has ever known the court to be anything different. In April of 2021, four Democratic members of Congress introduced legislation, the Judiciary Act of 2021, that would add four seats to the Supreme Court, and which, if passed, would balance the number of justices with the Circuit Court of Appeals, which has 13, allowing the court to be consistent with the number of justices as it was originally determined. The argument being, if we used to have nine circuits and nine justices, but now we have 13 circuits, why don't we have 13 justices? Of course, that wouldn't be the only reason. The court is currently packed with partisan hacks. The bill would allow President Biden to immediately name four individuals to fill those seats and give the Democrats a seven to six majority. The bill amends a provision of federal law providing that the Supreme Court consist of a chief justice and eight associate justices to read that the court shall consist of a chief justice and 12 associate justices, any eight of whom shall be considered a quorum. So five could be missing at a time and they could still do their job. Quite frankly, they'd probably get more done. But without the Senate, and with the filibuster intact, that bill is unlikely to pass anytime soon. If, however, Democrats hold the House and get a couple more senators, it might just have a chance. And though adding seats to the Supreme Court would previously have been considered very radical, I hazard to say that if our current Supreme Court continues down the path of eliminating voter right protections and privacy laws and women's rights and pushing us towards some sort of full theocracy, not adding justices to balance them out would become the more radical position. The politics of Supreme Court reform has moved very quickly in recent years. As Ian Milhazer wrote for Vox, it's now possible to imagine a critical mass of lawmakers rallying behind court expansion if the majority of the court justices start handing down decisions that outrage the majority of the country. And yes, the proposed court expansion bill will effectively neutralize all the behind-the-scenes work Republicans have done to ensure their GOP-controlled court. But I find that hard not to see as a good thing.
not because I'm a Democrat, but because I believe we need the Supreme Court to be a legitimate and trustworthy institution and not a partisan compromised arm of one party or another. We are at a tipping point with the Supreme Court. Should the president and Congress choose to add justices, I don't believe they would be packing the court, but rather balancing a court that is already packed. It's packed. Mitch McConnell and Leonard Leo already saw to that. Finally, we can't discuss the Supreme Court without discussing the potential new justice that will replace Stephen Breyer on the bench. The Republican outrage machine was running full steam against a yet-to-be-named nominee the day Breyer announced his retirement, calling her, because Biden had promised to nominate a black woman, a radical activist judge, a politician in a robe who would be beholden to secret donors who would transform the country, ignore the people, and shred the Constitution. First of all, the nominee had yet to be named, so that was a lot of accusations to throw around without a target. And as Senator Whitehouse reminds us, this is the same group of right-wing donors who paid to capture the Supreme Court, now attempting to distract us from their own organization. Their accusations of dark money and political corruption are a bizarre reimagining of the very strategy they themselves hatched and executed. President Biden thoroughly vetted four potential nominees, all of whom he believed could draw the support of Republican senators during the nomination process. And despite the talk we hear about this potential justice being some left-wing radical, President Biden said that he was looking for a candidate with an open mind who understands the Constitution and would interpret it in a mainstream way. His language seeming to echo Senate Republicans who have publicly called for a nominee who is mainstream and can operate in a nonpartisan manner, which, in my opinion, is pretty rich coming from the party that did the exact opposite with their own nominees. Biden has settled on the seemingly extraordinary U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson, whom the Senate just confirmed to the D.C. Court Circuit last June in a vote of 53 to 44, with unanimous support of all Democratic senators and three Republicans, Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins, and Lindsey Graham. Jackson joins many of the other Supreme Court justices as being a graduate of Harvard Law School, but is unique in also having served as a public defender, which is rare among Supreme Court nominees. Brown Jackson is known for being an incredibly sharp legal mind with a full commitment to equal protection under the law. She gained some notoriety during the Trump administration when she wrote that the former White House counsel John McGahn would have to obey a congressional subpoena because presidents are not kings. They do not have subjects bound to loyalty or blood whose destiny they are entitled to control. And plot twist, her husband's twin brother is also married to former Republican Speaker of the House Paul Ryan's sister. Ryan actually spoke for Brown Jackson during her 2012 confirmation hearing, saying, Our politics may differ, but my praise for Katanji's intellect, for her character, for her integrity is unequivocal. She is an amazing person, and I favorably recommend your consideration. Mitch McConnell is calling for the Senate to conduct a rigorous, exhaustive review of Judge Brown Jackson, considering she is being nominated for a lifetime appointment. So after strong arming the completely inexperienced Amy Coney Barrett onto the court in less than a month, he is now adamant we take a full scale, no stone unturned approach to vetting justices. <laughs> OK, no matter what the Republicans think, I think we can be pretty sure Biden is going to get his pick. The filibuster was removed for the Supreme Court justices by McConnell himself to make sure his justices would go through. So the Democrats only need a simple majority. And provided the Democrats vote together, which they did only eight months ago, and the senator from New Mexico is fully recovered from his recent stroke, they will get their justice without a single Republican vote. It might not change the partisan makeup of the court, but at the very least, we can be pleased our court will now look a little bit more like real America, and a previously silent demographic will finally have a voice. In 1789, the founders were concerned that the country would splinter, that each state would end up deferring to its own laws and customs. They believed in the importance of the Supreme Court and one overarching set of laws overseen by an independent judiciary that would unite us all. And in many ways, it worked. Until the judiciary was corrupted by greed and power and religion, and we now find ourselves in the very place the founders created the courts to avoid, splintered, ununited, and in danger of collapse. The most important thing to remember as we watch this far-right court attempt to fundamentally reshape the country is that things can only change if we expand the Democratic majority in Congress. The legislative branch is the only check we have on the judiciary. We don't have the luxury of losing the House. We must expand the Senate and keep the presidency. 
Those who seek to take us backward, to steal our freedoms, are calculated and cunning and backed by billions. However, we still have our voices, our vote, and the majority sentiment in the country. So we expand Congress, and we push to expand the Supreme Court, because these people do not speak for us. And without the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, we have a country without law and order. And without law and order, we have no country at all. So that's it for today. Be confident in knowing this activist court is playing with fire. If court precedent is so easy to throw away, why should we respect the precedent they are setting now? If this is what the court chooses to be, expanding it wouldn't undermine its legitimacy, it would save it. And I'm for anything that saves this country. Now go out and make the world a better place. Thank you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.